so much to the Whatcom Conservation District for inviting me up here. Um, as she said, I live in the Columbia River Gorge. I have for about seven years now, and don't judge me for living in California for 10 years. I'm a native of Oregon, so I just had a little sojourn in California for a while. Um, but thrilled to be back in the Northwest and up here in this beautiful corner of Washington State. Today, um, I'm going to be talking about some successful models in, um, in aggregating and marketing meat. And uh, a lot of these models actually have applicability to vegetable producers and fruit producers and people who grow other products. So don't think that if, if you don't um, raise meat animals, that this doesn't apply to you. All right, so before I jump into the content a little bit, uh, just wanted to give a little background. Oh, I guess this is my clicker. There we go. Uh, so I've, I've worked in agriculture for about 22 years, mostly in uh, adult education and training beginning farmers. Um, but I did have a stint in running a pretty successful pastured livestock and poultry operation in California with my um, ex-partner. And the name of that farm was TLC Ranch, which of course stands for Tastes Like Chicken. <laughs> uh, we ran that for about six years until we got to the point where we realized, we, oops, that shocks, um, we realized that we couldn't purchase land in California. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with high land prices here in your own corner of Washington, but at the time, uh, land was going for about $50,000 an acre. Um, and you can imagine how you would cash flow an operation like that uh, would be pretty challenging. You wouldn't pay off a mortgage for a long, long time. Um, but anyway, we scaled our business starting off with a few hundred chickens and uh, a couple hundred broiler chickens. And by the, by the sixth year, we were raising 10,000 broiler chickens, 5,000 laying hens, Pharaoh to finish about 300 pigs a year. And then we had a small flock of sheep and beef cattle, mainly just for lawn mowing purposes. But our, our main enterprises were eggs, broiler chicken, and pork. Um, and we got big enough that we actually were selling eggs into Whole Foods markets, so we had these fancy um, pre-printed cartons for a while. And yeah, that's, that's when we were in our happier times. <laughs> That's the last day at the farmer's market for our business. I was pretty ecstatic selling my last package of bacon there. <laughs> and then after that, uh, we sold our business and we actually took a year off to travel around the country visiting successful and innovative farming operations. Um, because I didn't grow up in agriculture, I actually grew up in uh, suburban Beaverton, um, I didn't really come to agriculture with any sort of dogma or belief system about how I needed to raise uh, crops or animals. And so I've always really relied on um, drawing from other successful models. And I, and I think it's important to kind of expand your horizons and, and look, at, look at what's happening in other parts of the country and um, kind of glean best practices from other farmers. And so we had a wonderful opportunity to spend a whole year on the road uh, traveling around in our RV with our daughter and visiting uh, really unique and successful organic and pastured operations around the country. Um, and out of that, my first book uh, was written, Farms with a Future. Got a couple of them for sale after this talk. Um, but this, this book was really, uh, really inspired by when we were farming, there was no business guides for running a farm. There was a lot of great production books out there on how to grow the best crops and raise the best animals, but none of them talked about actually running the business side of the operation. Everything from marketing to pricing your products, uh, record keeping, bookkeeping, human resources, how to have employees, all of these things we didn't know anything about when we started. So I decided to glean the wisdom from all of these farms around the country and put it into a book. Then we moved to Oregon, 
and uh, basically just started homesteading on about five acres, so primarily growing for personal consumption and then um, getting more and more into home butchery and charcuterie and learning how to make all of our own um, meat products on the farm. Um, and then the genesis of my second book, which is The New Livestock Farmer and what I'll be mainly talking about today. So the key objectives of that book, The New Livestock Farmer, um, were fourfold, and, and this is also the, the meat of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I wrote that book because I wanted farmers to be successful and thrive and earn a fair living for their work. Um, both of my books are focused on, on commercial production, not on hobby farms. I actually want farms to make money and I don't want them to just be a tax write-off. So it's really important to me that you guys get paid for what you do. Um, secondly, that uh, farmers are able to treat both themselves and their employees and their animals as humanely and ethically as possible. Third, uh, that their production practices can be gentle and even restorative on our natural resources. And fourth, that really we're producing nutrient-dense, tasty food that gets out to a wider audience of people. Okay, so why now? Why is it important what you guys do, growing food and raising animals? Well, we're, we're in a bit of a pickle here with, with the human population on this planet. Over half of the world's population now, currently, has a chronic lifestyle disease. Half. This is the first time in human history that more people are dying from too many calories than too little calories. First time ever in, what, four million years of human history. Um, however, high quality meat and dairy and eggs can really be a, a key part of restoring people's health and part of a, a well-rounded diet, as I'm sure you guys are all aware. And consumers are looking for humane and local and pasture-based meat and animal products in greater and greater quantities. Um, in fact, it's you know the largest growing sector in grocery stores in the meat meat case are um, you know grass-fed organic and pasture-based uh, meat products. So what are the possibilities? Well. Uh, Things are looking actually pretty bright for, for innovative farmers. Uh, in the last 10 years, seven of those years, grass-fed beef uh, was more profitable than growing corn on a per acre basis. Well-managed grazing lands, as, as many of you are aware, can sequester carbon, they can build soil, replenish aquifers, provide habitat for wildlife, scenic vistas, and excellent fire control. Um, they also produce more net calories than the most input-intensive croplands. More net calories per acre with well-managed uh, ruminant animal production than the most intensive corn, soybean field, or any other crop that you could grow. And then, you know, of course, well-managed grazing lands and thriving farms are what is necessary to keep farm and ranch lands in production and not sold off for development. I keep wanting to click on my computer. <laughs> so what about this region? Well, you guys have, you guys have a lot of um, excellent competitive advantages, I would say. Uh, you know, you're blessed with ample water, many, in some cases, a little too much. Uh, you have close proximity to millions of customers, and a lot of them are customers that have money. Uh, up here, at least, you have a little little slightly more protected farmland than other parts of uh, Washington so there's there's more land in production you have amazing soils uh, you even though everyone complains about lack of meat processing you actually do have two USDA meat processors uh, there's some feed milling in this region of course you have a historical dairy um, region and still many dairies are, are thriving and then you have some great organizations in the region like the Conservation District, the Northwest Ag Business Center, uh, the e Local First uh, Map, um, and a lot of really committed consumers that are educated. 
Um, of course, not all is rosy. There are some challenges, but that's not the purpose of my talk today. But I'm just going to scan through. And I really think every challenge is really just an opportunity in disguise. So, of course, you know, uh, overgrazing can happen without proper management. Excess, excess nutrient and pathogen runoff is, is a concern. Uh, set stocking, which is where you leave your animals in one place for a long time, um, can really damage habitats and waterways. You know, you have wildlife uh, livestock conflicts, um, but that can be mitigated with good fencing and excellent livestock guard dogs. Uh, you know, you are losing farmland and grazing land to development. Weather's getting a little wacky. Uh, there is increasing competition from non-animal proteins, but I'm not going to focus on, on the lab meats today. <laughs> and then, you know, more and more animal rights activists that are making some of our lives a little bit hard. However, these are not insurmountable obstacles, they are just unrealized opportunities. So let's move from a fixed mindset to a growth one. Let's talk about some of the successful and innovative models that have worked around the country and see what we can glean from those models that could maybe be used in this region. So I'm going to talk about kind of five different areas uh, of innovation and meat marketing and aggregation that I, that I find really interesting. And in my work um, for Extension, I work with small meat producers and processors from around the country. So I get to hear about a lot of really cool stuff um, as part of my job. So I've tried to pull together some of those ones that I think you guys might find most interesting. So what works? Well, the first, first thing that I know that works is cooperation. And uh, in the earlier talk, uh, you guys heard about a few different cooperatives in the region, including the North Cascades Meat Producers Cooperative. Of course, you have the Island Grown Farmers Cooperative that I think turns 20 next year. So you have a couple well-established cooperatives in this region. Um, some other uh, neat ones that I like are the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative in Arkansas. Uh, that includes farmers, Arkansas, Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, North Carolina, and Missouri now. Uh, the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative in Wisconsin, Painted Hills Natural Beef, and also Country Natural Beef in Oregon are two beef cooperatives nearby. Another beef cooperative in New Mexico called Sweetgrass, another one in Texas, and then a poultry and duck and rabbit cooperative that started a couple years ago in Eugene called Heart of the Valley Cooperative. Um, these are all just, I'm not gonna go into detail about each one, but they're all, they're all examples of farmers coming together, deciding to standardize their practices so that they all follow the same protocols. Um, in many cases, they're using the same breed so that they can have consistent quality in the marketplace. Um, and, and then they, they aggregate their products, sell under the same brand, and are able to get into larger marketplaces as a result. So instead of every farmer thinking they need to create their own individual brand for their 10 animals or their 20 animals, um, coming together m might just be the best opportunity for you to scale up and also to not have to invest all of that time and effort into creating your own brand. Um, it is a considerable uh, amount of work to do it well. Oh, I should say I'm going to reserve um, time at the end for questions. So please hold those excellent questions. Oops. So here's an example of the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative, the one in Arkansas. Um, this one was actually uh, started by Heifer International, which is a poverty eradication nonprofit that provides animals to poor people around the world. Well, they're based in Arkansas, and so they realized there was a lot of small, struggling family farmers in Arkansas that were raising a few animals here and there. So they basically, they, they uh, invested the money on, for them to work with a consultant to develop a cooperative and all of the operating procedures and file all the legal paperwork and organize the initial meetings of the farmers. And then the farmers got developed protocols and standards for raising the different species of animals that they raise. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later in my show, slideshow an example of how they sell their meat. 
but you can see the growing list of farms that just started in Arkansas, and now it's uh, now they're including farms as far away as Texas. So they're growing. Um, what else works? Vertical integration. You know, if you take economics or macroeconomics, uh, you, you hear that vertical integration is bad because it just makes companies get really big and have too much market control. But for small and mid-scale farms, it just might be the ticket for you to capture more value and to also reduce some of your input costs. So Gunthorpe Farms uh, started out raising pigs and chickens, and then they built their own processing plant. Now they do in their own distribution. Uh, White Oak Pastures in Georgia also was a cattle operation. Then they built their own red meat plant. They built their own uh, poultry plant. They do nationwide distribution now, um, mail order and internet, uh, frozen meat sales around the country. Uh, Pure Country Pork in Washington started out just with pigs, or they also grow their own grain. Uh, and then a, a few years ago, they bought a USDA processing plant out in Moses Lake, so now they do their own processing. Um, Jameson Farm in Pennsylvania is grass-fed lamb. They bought a nearby uh, processing plant that, was, that had gone out of business, and they uh, resurrected it, and now they do all their own processing and process for other farmers in the region. Uh, Bauman Cedar Valley Farms in Kansas. This is an Amish farm. They do everything. They raise animals, they grow grain, they mill grain, they have a poultry plant, and they have a red meat plant. So luckily they have lots of children, so <laughs> that's how they do it there. Uh, Ranch Foods Direct in uh, Colorado. They're, they raise the animals in Kansas. They have a mobile slaughter trailer on that farm in Kansas that's actually stationary, have the animals killed there, and then they have a USDA butcher shop in Colorado Springs. And then they also uh, wholesale distribute to restaurants all around Colorado. And then the last one, North Star Bison Company, started out again raising their own animals, and now they're the largest bison producer in the country. They actually work with other farmers now to raise to their protocol, and they bought a USDA plant uh, about four years ago, and they also do all their own distribution as well. Here's just a picture of White Oak Pastures, that farm in Georgia that I was telling you about, and the red meat plants in the middle, the poultry plants right next to it, and then further to the right is a food pavilion where they actually serve food to all their employees and then on the weekends uh, the public can come out and actually eat, buy, buy food there. What else works? Well, adding a retail or restaurant component um, is another way that you can capture more value. Rebel Meat Company in Oregon, uh, they started out by opening up two restaurants, uh, Grain and Gristle and Old Salt Marketplace, um, and they were doing whole animal butchery and having all their animals processed at Mark's Meats in Canby. Well, the owners of Mark's Meats said, we want to retire, you guys are our biggest customer, do you want to buy our plant? And so now they run a USDA meat processing plant. But they started with the restaurant, and then they worked backwards from there. Uh, Foothills Local Meat in North Carolina in Asheville, um, they started out with, uh, well, they, they, they started out as a farm. Then they built their own retail exempt butcher shop. Then they've opened up two restaurants called Butcher Bars, which have a little tiny butcher shop inside a restaurant. And then they also built um, a food truck as well to sell burgers and they're doing really well in, in the Asheville area. Tails and Trotters in Portland, um, they, they, they don't raise their own animals, but they work with Pure Country Pork to do hazelnut finished pork for them on contract. Um, but they built a retail uh, exempt butcher shop in Portland and are doing, doing super well there. And then Side Hill Farmers Deli, that's, that's a really interesting model. It's actually a cooperative deli and butcher shop, so a bunch of farmers own it together. 
Um, they wanted a retail market, and they didn't even have a grocery store in their community. I can't remember the name of the town. Um, but they got a USDA grant to write a business plan for this idea, and the business plan looked good. Um, and then they sold shares as a cooperative to get it off the ground, and now it's this thriving butcher shop slash deli slash small grocery store. Um, and then the last one is also a really unique model. Um, it is a brewery, but it's also a butcher shop. Uh, they also do USDA processing for farmers. Um, I visited a couple years ago and it was like beer and meat in the same space. It was a beautiful thing to me. <laughs> um, and then they also raise their own animals as well. But they started with the restaurant and brewery before they started raising their own animals. So they developed the market before they raised animals. Here's just an example of uh, the Foothills local meat, this is their um, their food truck. And the cool thing about this food truck is they actually park it in the parking lot of a brewery, and this particular brewery didn't have a restaurant, um, it just had beer, but they wanted to be able to have food on site without building out a whole restaurant. So the food truck just comes and parks there on the weekends, so it's, it's a perfect marriage. All right. What else works? Well, there's a lot of new innovative uh, buying club slash CSA slash delivery models. Um, whether that means that you're getting a box of meat shipped to your doorstep, or you have to go to a central uh, drop-off location and get it, um, or you're getting a quarter of an animal, but you're getting it in uh, small increments throughout the, throughout the year, so you don't have to have a giant freezer. Um, Carmen Ranch in the Wallowas in Oregon, they sort of started the, the quarter beef model where instead of having to have a big freezer, um, they, you get a delivery four times a year. So it's a nice way to kind of spread out the cost for the consumer and also not require a special freezer. Uh, J&L Green Farm in Virginia, they sort of modeled themselves after Joel Salatin's farm, but they set up these um, buying clubs all around the Washington, D.C. area. And so they have different um, private homes or gyms or other locations where they have drop spots. And so they deliver at least 10 boxes to one site. To get a drop spot, you have to have at least 10 customers to come together, and then they'll deliver to you. And they do that once a month. They have a different route that they do once a month. Uh, Seven Sons in Indiana is a farm that created a, um, an online platform to sell meat and eggs and dairy products. And now they work with a bunch of other local farms in Indiana um, to sell their meat as well. Deck Family Farms in Oregon, they do a CSA, but it's, it's called a full diet CSA. This, I can't imagine how hard these farmers work, but they have a dairy, or a micro creamery rather. They raise animals, they have eggs, and they grow vegetables, and they grow grains. So consumers buy into their CSA, and they basically get everything they need to eat healthy, except for like salt and olive oil. Um, the Daybreak Growers Alliance in Maine, this is one I just found out about. It's um, like it sounds, it's a growers alliance of about 25 farms in Maine, but instead of each farm having their own individual CSA, they just all came together and they sell a vegetable share, they sell a meat share, and then they sell a mixed share to consumers around Portland, Maine. Um, and then the last one, which I mentioned before, is the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative. This is an example of the Seven Sons uh, website. So you can get like a mixed bundle, which is that top left one, or you can get you know individual species and just get, order a box. Um, I think they deliver once a month. I'm gonna see if I can, actually, I don't know if I can do this. Can you push it? I'm gonna just show you a video of the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative box. We'll see if it works. If you go back to the one with the video thing, that there should be a little thing that pops up on the bottom. 
there. So I get this meat box once a month. Probably can't hear the volume. But basically once a month it's delivered to my doorstep. And this is what it looks like on the inside. You can ship meat across the country. I even got a box in August, and I thought for sure it was going to be thawed out. It was rock hard. Is it nitrogen? But what, check out the packaging. It's pretty cool. I didn't want to buy anything that came with styrofoam or nasty stuff. So those are full of recycled blue jeans. Wow. Yeah. And I've actually saved them all, and I'm using them to insulate my pipes underneath my house. <laughs> then dry ice. Really, really cold dry ice. It hurt my hands. <laughs> and then this is what it looks like underneath. So I get a mixed meat box once a month. Um, I don't usually customize it. I usually get the same kind of set order. But every once in a while, I can just go into my login and customize it a little bit if I'm like, oh, I still have a couple chickens left in the freezer. I'm going to get something different this month. But it's nice you can set it up as either like a, custom or a set order each month, or you can customize it each month. It's totally up to the consumer. So that's jowl bacon, which is from here. It's a little cheaper than belly bacon. I don't really care. It's just bacon. <laughs> it tastes really good. And the neat thing about grassroots is um, they actually um, are half owners of a red meat plant and a poultry plant. So they went in with an existing processor. So they have really nice quality packaging. That is uh, beef shanks. So they have beef, lamb, and their primo product is their poultry. They, their poultry processing and packaging is beautiful, really well done. Um, it's, it's incredibly tasty chicken. As someone who used to raise chicken, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of their chicken. And then I think that is a uh, shoulder roast, a pork shoulder roast, yeah. Anyway. Um, you can stop that. But just showing you how how um, how online meat sells, like what what it actually looks like in a box. <laughs> All right, let's see. A couple more models here. How are we on time? Good. Okay. So another way to add value um, to what you're doing is adding value, is uh, doing some further processing. So um, since I'm not just talking about meat but other animal products, I thought I'd mention a couple other um, operations that I'm familiar with. Uh, garden variety cheese, they are um, uh, on-farm um, sheep dairy where they make artisan cheeses, yogurt. Uh, they also do grass-fed pork. Uh, excuse me, whey-fed pork, so they take the whey from their creamery, feed it to the pigs, and they do grass-fed lamb, of course. Uh, Clareville Farm in California is a micro-creamery that does its own raw milk bottling. Um, I think it's probably the smallest dairy that I've ever seen in my life. It just has six stalls for milking. Um, I think it never has more than 50 cows in production. Um, but it's it's a Jersey creamery. They they put things in glass bottles, sell it for a premium, and with just that few number of animals, they can make a living off of that. Uh, Lark's Meadow Farm is an award-winning uh, sheep artisan sheep dairy in Idaho that makes extraordinary cheeses. Uh, Landcrafted Foods in Virginia started out as a grass-fed beef operation. They got a grant to build a small USDA plant to do uh, grass-fed beef sticks and jerkies. And then the piggery in New York was a, uh, was a pig farm um, that 
built its own USDA plant to make uh, sliced deli meats, which is, you know, you can't, it's very hard to find like high quality pasture raised, good quality deli meats, um, and that's what they're doing. Here's an example of that Lane Crafted Foods Company and their branding and their nice uh, beef snack sticks. So the, sort of the last area of um, innovative models that I want to talk to, these are sort of the outliers that are doing some really creative and unique things. Uh, Garden Variety Cheese, that same um, artisan creamery in California, they, they do what they call an Adopt-A-U program. So every year they sell to their customers. Uh, you can adopt a U and her, um, her lambs for, I can't remember how much money, but out of it, you get a certain amount of cheese, you get a certain amount of yogurt, and then you also get a nice uh, lamb hide from one of her lambs, or a lamb, you know, might not be one of her lambs, but anyway, she sends the hides off to an Amish tannery in Pennsylvania and gets them back, and they're the most beautiful little lamb hides you've ever seen. So I just thought that was kind of a unique way to get a little upfront capital. She does this in the winter time to get the upfront capital to, uh, to feed out her animals until they start producing milk again. Um, Six Buckets Farm in Ohio, they uh, raise pigs and cattle on pasture. And in the winter time when their cash flow is low, uh, we did this on our farm as well, they do on-farm butchery classes. So they just sort of built out a commercial kitchen space in one of their outbuildings and uh, their butchery classes have been selling out uh, all winter long, attracting chefs from Cleveland and Cincinnati and home cooks. Uh, Misty Brook Farm in Maine has probably the most unique farm stand I've ever seen. It's open 24 hours a day, and it's on the honor system. And <laughs> they did recently install a fake camera that's not actually turned on because they have had a couple little issues, but very minor. I, I mean, they the amount that they lose is so minor, it still wouldn't pay to have an employee standing there at their farm stand. Uh, j &L Green Farm in Virginia, um, he runs a YouTube channel called Far farm, Bu farm Builder Entrepreneurs. Uh, he's really, really innovative farm, but anyway, their YouTube channel's gotten so popular that now they're doing weekend intensive courses about four times a year on how to raise pastured pork. So he's now making money off of both YouTube and these intensive classes that he's offering on his farm. So that's just another way you can add value to, to your operation. And then White Oak, White Oak Pastures that I mentioned earlier, um, they built a couple cabins on their farm in Georgia. I think their farm is about a thousand acres um, and they have some beautiful lakes on their property. They built some cabins around the lakes and now they offer farm stays um, on their farm. So that's kind of another neat way to add value. And here's that Six Buckets farm in Ohio um, doing a butchery class. The other neat thing about butchery classes is you create lifelong customers when people know how to butcher their own animals. They may never do it, but um, they're also more likely to buy a side of an animal or a whole animal from you and break it down themselves. And um, and not only will they become lifelong customers, but they will they will tell the word of your farm to all their friends and family and boast about you on Facebook and show pictures of them at their butchery class. You know how cool they are. But great great marketing tool. All right, so five minutes, okay. I think I am just, just gonna go through a couple more things. So, oops, I keep forgetting. So in, in the book, I really talk about how to direct market meat or other animal products, but these are sort of the key steps. Um, and this, this presentation will be available after, afterwards and also on YouTube and in the book, so you don't need to write this down. But really, you know, produce a great product should be step number one. You gotta be able to produce a high quality product. You should know your product inside and out and be really proud of it. You need to know your market and your clientele. You really should become an expert in the regulations, if you can. 
develop the necessary infrastructure to do it right, manage your business well, and price your products appropriately. So how do you create that, that high quality product? Well, uh, this is from a book called Good to Great, but really, what are you most, most passionate about? What can you be the best in the world at? And what drives your economic engine? So really ask yourselves those three questions. With the little caveat that we are talking about a biological system, we're not talking about widgets here, so it really has to obviously be in line with your natural resource conditions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just pop to the very end. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Sorry, can't talk fast enough. Um, I'll be selling my books afterwards, but I would love to open it up for questions now. Awesome, thank you, Rebecca. So if folks have questions, I can say it into this so then everybody else can hear you. Uh, thank you for presenting. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. The first one is, um, do you know the legality of shipping dry ice? And um, I was really fascinated by that recycled denim insulation. Mm -hmm. And do you know if that's shredded or how that's processed? Those are great questions. Um, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will give you my card after this, and I would love to follow up on those questions because I think for my work, I work for the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. Uh, we work with small meat processors and meat companies, and there's more and more interest in people shipping meat. Um, that seems to be a frequent question on our listserv. So I'd love to do some research on those two specific topics on recyclable packaging and, and dry ice regulations. So I'm gonna get back to you on that, but great question. Any other questions? Experience working with uh, like grass-fed beef or other livestock um, aggregation in production, as far as like farms doing cow-calf pairs and other farms doing um, fi finishing beef. And yeah, what do you what do you think about that model? And is there anyone in the Pacific Northwest doing that kind of um, aggregation that you know of? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, a couple of the cooperatives that I mentioned, uh, Painted Hills, Country Natural Beef, and even Grassroots Farmers Cooperative, not all of the beef producers are finishing operations, and not all of them are cow-calf operations. So there's a mixture in all of those cooperatives. So in some of the cases, they're just cow-calf operators, and then other members of the cooperative will buy their animals and finish them but everyone's finishing to the same standards, basically. Um, that's really critical if you are gonna aggregate uh, beef in particular because there, there's a real art and science to finishing animals properly. Um, and you, know, you want them finishing around the same age, um, ideally not going past 30 months to finish because then you have to bone out the entire spine um, because of BSE risk, that's a USDA law. Um, and ideally using the same breed or, uh, you know, like Angus type genetics if you're going to be an Angus organization. But yeah, everyone's got to get on the same page. Um, but, but yeah, several of those cooperatives do, they, they work together with the beef operators. And I think they actually, they all get together once a year to set prices. So. Um, I imagine you know the cow calf operators set their prices for calves and um, and then negotiate the the purchase of those calves. We had another question here. Hi. Seems like a lot of it is a, a marketing question for people. So do these farmers sit around the table and then all of a sudden they realize we need to hire a marketing director? Can you tell us what the when the light bulb goes off and people are what are they, what are they doing? Well, that is one of the beauties of uh, cooperatives or associations is you can pool your money together to actually hire a professional marketing manager or sales staff. 
So all of those cooperatives that I mentioned all have uh, sales and marketing staff. It might be just one person or it might be a whole team of people. Um, but as opposed to an individual farmer, where you get to be the sales and the marketing and the bookkeeper and the production manager and everything, and usually in one person, or maybe you're lucky to have a, a grown child who's, who's good at that kind of stuff. Um, but what was the question exactly? Yeah, I mean, you can do some of your own research uh, on the internet, and then my books have a couple of chapters on marketing and kind of marketing concepts. Um, and there are some there's some great resources on the internet for uh, each uh, each meat board, so the pork board, the national beef board, the poultry counselor board, they have a lot of uh, research documents on their websites um, that talk about consumer demographics and what cuts people are buying and what parts of the country. Um, that, like there's a study I just looked up for this talk called The Power of Meat. And it's produced every single year by some giant marketing firm. But you can download that report, and it really goes into detail, like where people are buying, what types of meat they're buying, um, what formats, you know, is it ready to eat, is it, is it whole roast, like that kind of stuff. So you can do a lot of kind of your preliminary research online. Is there any, just on a story, is there a... <laughs> Where have you walked away from more like, oh my gosh, those people are crazy or geniuses. Those people are crazy or geniuses. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I used to think just a few years ago that selling meat, um, shipping meat across the country and doing online meat sales, I used to think that was crazy. Um, I thought that sounds like a food safety nightmare to me. It sounds way too expensive, um, that they'll never be able to recoup those costs. But it's, it's grown and grown so much, and actually, as you scale up those businesses, you negotiate much cheaper shipping rates, and you just build the shipping into the cost. You say, free shipping. It's not free. You just build it into the cost of the box or add it onto the meat. And the technology's gotten so much better. Um, just these new forms of packaging didn't exist a few years ago. Like, to me, I thought, oh, this sounds like a packaging nightmare. Like, it's going to be a bunch of plastic and styrofoam and junk like that. Well, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Um, and I order that box from Arkansas, and it gets to me in three days, just absolutely rock hard frozen. So I'm like, OK. My, that paradigm has, has shifted on me, and I'm glad it is. Like, I always like to have my paradigms busted. I think that's good to continually reevaluate what I think I know. I don't want to be certain about anything. So I think we, I got to go because the next speaker's coming up. Yeah. We can take a few more. Oh, a few more? Yeah. OK. Any more questions? Done. Yeah, we've got about five more minutes. All right, here in the back. So essentially, scaling up is my question. So going from me and my partner have off-farm jobs, right, to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. We have a great resource of the farm, but then, and I can even find the customers, but then it's the transition of either finding labor or doing all the work myself and ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have good examples in any of your books about people who have successfully moved from that small to, you know, doing the whole thing? Yep. Yeah, um, several of the farms that I profile in my books went from you know both having off-farm jobs to just one of them having off-farm job, and then eventually, you know, in many cases, being able to eliminate those off-farm jobs, or one of them keeping the off-farm job for the benefits, um, which is what we did when we farmed. I, I was the one who had the off-farm job. Um, but but yeah, you you sort of have to you have to take like a, a measured approach in that and look at your long term goals. I mean, it is it is even though farms can be profitable, uh, it still is hard to put away that money for retirement when you're farming. Um, often it's just the land and the value of the land that is your retirement. And if you want to keep that land in production and not have to sell it off, like you don't really want to use that land as your your bank account. 
for retirement. So, um, but you know, I think the best way to be able to scale up is to have more demand than supply. So when you're at the point where you're continually selling out, you know, that's an indicator to you that you can, you can step it up a notch. How much to step it up a notch is the big question. And you know, maybe doing some more market surveys or pulling your customers or looking for some new customers and trying to kind of handshake secure a couple of new accounts, like maybe a restaurant or a small butcher shop, so that you can make that next step. Um, when we were farming, we were able to scale up uh, in a pretty risk-free way by partnering with a couple CSA farms who had vegetable CSAs, and they wanted to add, one wanted to add eggs and one wanted to add meat. And so they pre-sold those shares to their customers. They gave us half the money up front so we could expand our herd and our flock. And then we raised the animals, produced the meat and the eggs for them, and then got paid the rest of it. So that was a super secure way for us to scale up and know we had demand for that product. Awesome. Any, any last comments or questions for Rebecca? So I, I think it was really fascinating that you traveled around the country, and especially um, with your family in tow. So. Um, we're here with the Conservation District. That's who's putting on this event today. I'd love for you to just talk about how um, some innovative conservation practices that you see have seen, or was there something really similarities that you saw across the country and what folks were putting in as far as conservation on their farms? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, some similarities that we saw were people using animals as a tool for restoration. Um, so pigs, for example, are fabulous tillers. Well, if you have a weedy area that's got invasive weeds, like I've seen pigs eradicate Johnson grass um, and other perennial grasses, I've seen them eradicate blackberry, Himalayan blackberry. Um, goats are also excellent at that. So uh, a lot of different farms will use their animals to for a specific management purpose. Um, the key is to you know know what know what that goal is and then to make sure you get your animals out of that area after they've achieved their goal. Um, and so that it, there's proper time for rest or replanting or whatever you're gonna do. So we went to a farm in Massachusetts that didn't have a tractor, um, but grew all their own grains. And I was like, how do you grow all your own grains for your animals? And they say, oh, we use pig tillage. And they had really rocky ground. They couldn't till it with a tractor anyway. I mean, it was, it was like, the it, it looked like Ireland. I mean, it was so rocky there. And uh, so what they do is they uh, spread some hay that had the seed in it for the mixtures that they wanted to plant um, all around these pastures. And then also threw, threw some corn out there as well just to get the pigs enticed. And then they let the pigs in there, and they just set up portable electric fencing for the area they wanted them in. And the pigs went in, and they scratched through the hay, and they dug it up, and they and they looked for the corn, and they just tilled the ground for them. And they put them in there for about five days, and then they'd move them out. And then the rains would come, and the hay mix would grow, and they wouldn't put the pigs back in for about six months. Uh, till, the, till the pasture grew up exactly what they wanted it to, to grow. So using animals can be a fabulous tool for growing things you want, for eradicating weeds, um, and for creating the landscapes that you're looking for. But again, it, it requires intensive management and not just forgetting about the animals. So 